Welcome to Uncomfortable Collisions with Reality with one of our, I don't like to call him an uncomfortable guest. He's a comfortable guest talking about uncomfortable things. His name is Jared Wheatley. He's, he works in out-of-home care, that is kids who have been removed from their parents for abuse or neglect or suspected abuse and neglect, and particularly the ones that are end up in some of the most trouble and uh, some of the most difficult cases. And Jared, who you will be able to see some other conversations I've had with Jared on this channel. Jared is off to Germany and we were talking about that and I wanted to introduce him and ask him to tell us what he's up to in Germany. Great. Thanks, Nicholas. Always good to be having these type of conversations with you and trying to get to some of the heart of what's actually going on in our human systems. So it is Jared Wheatley and I run an organization called Professional Individualized Care. And as you described, we're working with young people that are currently, that would otherwise be living in group homes or hotels. So we're working with young people that have had often 50 plus foster care placement breakdowns. And, and then find themselves in some form of institutionalized care. And you were, you were you know, picking up there that I'm just off to Germany and it's something we've talked about in the past, but the model I'm actually running, the origins of it came about in Germany in the late 80s when they changed their child protection legislation away from a protection lens and towards a connection lens. And so it went from the right of the state to protect children to the right for families to get help. This has obvious implications if you to change that lens on how many children you're going to remove in the first place. Because if you're actually engaging with families in a constructive way that's informed by real relationships, you're far more likely to be able to preserve those family systems together. And there's a lot to say about when, when children can stay in their family, they're far more likely to have stable yep. lifelong connections. We'll have to, we'll have a session about that, I think. But you get on with your story about uh, the, the idea you've got, you've had, you had the idea you had in your trip to Germany, what you're doing there and what you've wanted to do, what you wanted to do on this trip, but had to at least postpone. The key goal for me coming out of this trip is to reconnect with our partner organization, but also other services that are running this model. There's 47 of them just in Germany, let alone in France and Greece, and set up an exchange program. Uh, firstly, our young people that are in my organization, but then the hope is to expand that out to other young people in the care of the Department of Communities and Justice. And the idea, the idea behind it is, is twofold. One, to be able to have rich childhood experiences. So... I went on exchanges growing up. I know that's not everyone's experience, but I got a lot out of you know, broadening my worldview and being exposed to different ideas. And amongst other things, I actually met my wife on an exchange you know, that we later on in life became you know, partners and she's German. And it was because of that that I was back in Germany working with refugees in 2009, 2010. So we can say in part, I, I probably wouldn't have been in a position to pull this this cultural framework, this model from Germany back to Australia later on yep. in my career, if I hadn't experienced the benefits of living overseas. And the idea is to be able to find for first my children some short-term three-month change experiences, and they could be used as rites of passage. Now, they, well, now when you say my children, you mean the children in, your, in the system that you're running? Yes, certainly not my, my own biological children. I mean, the children that are in, that are in yep. the care of my organization. Yeah, and so yeah. the, the hope is to give them those experiences either around rites of passage, but I'd hope to be able to expand out and offer it to many of the children that are living in substandard situations within our current care system and, and offer also our system a way to understand the child better. Because if you're taking them out of their current situation for a short-term kind of tailored intervention, that, that intake and assessment process can... It's not only far better than their existing care, but it can also help inform their future care needs because the system, if they've just removed a child, often doesn't actually understand them very well or understand the needs of that family. Mm -hmm. So any, so this kind of exchange program in our, amongst out-of-home care kids is quite common in Europe. Is that, is that right? 
My partner organization has been running it, yes, yeah, since the early 90s. And in fact, yes. the first, first thing my partner organization was called was Outback. So an English word, because they were taking yes, that's right. children yeah. to the Australian Outback. And so yeah. they've been running these type of short-term travel experiences as part of what they see as a holistic picture of how you need to yeah. help create an environment that a child feels relationally safe enough to drop out of hypervigilance and start to process trauma. And yeah. seeing travel as a very useful tool, certainly not for all young people in the care yeah. system, but for a lot of them, it would be quite useful. Yeah. So that's, I guess we should just quickly touch on that point that you've raised, which is it's not going to be, it's, it's sort of like you've got a lot of kids who are learning to walk and doing this is a bit like running, skipping and jumping. So you would have, you, you would be taking kids who you have particularly assessed as very likely to benefit from this sort of thing. Absolutely. And what's really key in that is someone knowing the child well. And that's not always possible if it's someone that would be coming externally from our organization, but certainly yes. Externally yes. in the organization, yes. you can have a high degree of confidence. Is this going to be something that's actually going to be useful for the child? And yeah. you know, it goes without saying, if it isn't, then it's not worth the expense and the time and the energy to, to send them. So as I was telling you earlier, Australia's run a policy, which it was it called way back in 86 when this was launched, Minimum Effective Regulation. It was announced by the Hawke government and all the states now use similar systems. And so I'm very confident, Jared, that when you spoke to the people involved in out-of-home care, that they said, right, well, we're engaged in minimum effective regulations, so we will be very flexible and we'll make sure that, of course, the regulatory objectives, which is to keep kids safe and to give them experiences that are more likely to develop them than damage them, I'm sure that they really bent over backwards to make sure that they were making this possible for you. It's unfortunately not the case. We've, we've had a, yeah, we've After had a really hard run. 35 years, I'm shocked. Well, I'm yeah. shocked to hear this. We, we've had a really hard run of this one. There's been a lot of people, they instantly hear the idea and think, wow, there's so many young people this is going to be better for. And of course, let, let's give this a go. Yep. And I'm quite lucky that I've got great infrastructure right across Europe because of our partnerships. Yep. So we, we can also deliver very quickly on this. Um, there's a couple of problems here. There's our regulatory frameworks aren't designed to support it. So I'll give you a clear example. That will say something like if the child's going to spend somewhere more than 21 days, then it's seen as a placement. And if it's a placement, then you need to go through our Australian probity checks. Now, if you've got a carer with 20 years experience in Germany that's going to offer a three-month placement, they're authorized under the German probity checks, but yes. they're not exactly going to have gone to service New South Wales and had a working with children's check. Yeah. And so for that reason alone, you know, the regulator says we don't have a way to approve this. And DCJ legal, they say we want to see this happen, but we have no way to make this happen in our current yeah. framework. Yeah. And so you get a lot of people that are well intentioned that want to help. But we're three, four months into trying to get those approvals and we haven't really stepped any, you know, taken any significant strides forward yet. Yeah. So as a policy person, let me tell you how this problem should be solved. How since I don't know when, if, if, it, if the program started in 1986, minimum effective regulation, we should have been onto this within a few years of starting that. And that is that, well, let me tell you how minimum effective regulation works. It's very kind of out of a textbook. The basic idea is whenever there's new regulation, a regulatory impact statement is done. Now, the regulatory impact statement is a kind of paper exercise. And have, if you ever do these things, you realize that you don't really have the information to work out the costs and benefits of these regulations. I'll give you a very specific example. We did a regulatory impact statement for New South Wales Health, and the, this was on regulation of pharmacies. And the particular issues in the regulation were how long a priceptorship is. A priceptorship is 
well, in law, it's called articles. It's this period of apprenticeship. You, after you do your formal study at a university, you then spend a period of working in a pharmacy and you do your apprenticeship. Should that be one year, as I think it is in Australia? Should it be nine months, as I think it is in other places? Should it be six months, as I think it is in Spain? We have no idea. You can try and read the literature, but the literature is, as you might expect, very, very, it doesn't know. So lesson one is that regulatory systems, if you want to get serious about regulation, it should be the business of the regulatory system to generate information which will help it know what it's doing, the costs it's imposing and the benefits that it's generating. That's point one. Point two, there should be rights to alternative compliance, or to put it in a different way, rights to regulatory flexibility. We know that the problem with regulation is that we, you set up a regulation with a particular mischief in mind, with a particular problem in mind, and you say, we are going to make sure that no child is placed in circumstances where the people they're dealing with haven't had a police check or haven't had a successful police check. That sounds, you know, it certainly goes over okay on the telly. It's not, it's unlikely that if you just do that, it's a particularly effective risk management strategy. Yeah. If you wanted to take it seriously, we'd be keeping those things in real time. And the moment something turned up on somebody's record, it would become visible to the system not in the three years later or one year later when they get another lease check done. So we actually go through the motions. It's, it's accountability theater. It's regulatory theater. It's not solving problems in the most effective way, despite a policy ad adopted by all Australian governments for 35 odd years for that to be the case. I'll bring uh, that back, and, back to on the ground of what that actually means, looks, feels like for me, is you, you're in a situation where you're not able to give a child a normative experience. Yeah, that, that there's yes. no burden on the other side of that conversation. That's right, partner. To that's say, right. what are we going to do to enable this child to be able to go on exchange, to be able to travel? And yeah, that, that discussion right. isn't there. It's effectively doesn't fit the framework. It's that's going right. to be too risky to the system to allow this yep. to take place. That's right. And, and the, the other thing to say of what you're bringing up is I've never in my personal life made a decision around saying I'm going to do a police check on that person. Now, look, certainly it's not going to hurt sometimes to have that information. But where I make my decisions is I get to know the person to know if they're trustworthy. Hmm. And the danger hmm. in these technical frameworks for child yep. safety, as of I would course. say them, is it leads practitioners on the ground to orientate towards getting those checks done, That's ticking right. the boxes. Right. doing the forms and procedures, but it's not policies and procedures that meet people's needs. People do. Yeah, That's the exactly. core of saying we're going to change the experience of the child. I, you know, what you're bringing up is it just rings really true for me as someone that's trying to navigate that system. Yeah. So, so your point about, bird, you haven't put it quite in these terms, but your point is really that your burden is to solve problems. The regulator's burden is somewhat different. They're trying to do something, and I always assume they're trying to do it as well as they can. I think so. But if they say no to you, that's the end of it. It's really not an issue for them. And Correct. so if you want this system to work properly, if you claim to have a policy which is minimum effective regulation, there needs to be some custodian of that policy because the child protection folks are dealing with child protection and they need to be they need to be answerable not just to child protection but also to the policy of minimum effective regulation or I think it would be better to call it maximally responsive regulation regulation that does respond to emerging needs and we haven't taken that seriously and for you, it's experienced as an issue in what you do. And of course, ultimately, that is to the great cost of the kids in your care. But it's also true for every manufacturer of fertilizers. It's true for people delivering services in doctor's surgeries. 
anything or lawyers, whatever, anything that is subject to regulation, we have not had our thinking caps on about this problem. We have endless reviews of regulation, usually done by business people, and they and they get handed this book, which is roughly the way it looked in 1986, and they adopt the policy again, or what I call government by amnesia. And then we go through the process. In fact, I will bring it up. I will bring it up on my screen and read it to you because here we are. Yes, it's coming up. Because this is not just our, pro this again, extraordinarily is replicated all around the world, certainly the English speaking world. I'm disgracefully monolingual. And I know the English speaking world a lot better than anywhere else. So this is written in 2007. So that's 15 odd years ago, 16 odd years ago, by the British Chambers of Commerce. And they wrote, both conservative and labor administrations approach deregulation with, and, and this is what we're talking about here, cutting red tape, if you like. And of course, notice that they only talk about the cutting red tape. They don't talk about doing the protective work that the regulation is there for in the first place. That's the other side of the coin. That's the benefits you're trying to generate. Both conservative and labor administrations in Britain approach deregulation with apparent enthusiasm, learn little or nothing from previous efforts, and have little, if anything, to show from each initiative. I expect I can almost feel a red tape cutting initiative coming on, maybe at the federal level, maybe at the state level with new governments in place. And it would be nice if it wasn't yet another exercise in government by amnesia. And with that, I will invite you to offer any concluding comments you have and wish you absolutely all the best in the next five weeks in Germany. I think the closing remark for me is is how are we going to put our humanity before our bureaucracy? I think that's how to frame this because I think we've all had lived experiences where we're on the wrong side of that. Yes. And yeah. I think it's just most urgent if you put a whole child's life within that framework, yeah. within yeah. that bureaucracy, yeah. which is what is happening for many of our children and families affected by the out of home care system. So I think yeah. the framing I like to use here yeah. is, is trying to go to the heart of the human experience of what the cost of that is to lives we are oh, destroying might be too harsh, but the, the lives we're adversely yeah, no, it's affecting. it's not too harsh. So it's I not think, too harsh. I think the framing for me is we have to put our humanity before our bureaucracy. Well, I'm, I'm going to frame it somewhat differently, which is that the bureaucracy, unfortunately, well, I'm not using bureaucracy in a pejorative sense. I'm just saying the apparatus for doing this stuff, that is inevitably there. So we have to find ways to put the humanity into the bureaucracy. And that isn't an easy thing to do. And it doesn't, and, and it might start with a conversation such as the one we're having, but it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of craft. And, and that, and, and so we're just at the beginning, you know, if anyone was interested in what we're saying, it isn't a matter of clicking a few fingers. It is a matter of taking all of the things that the system has to do very seriously. It's a matter of taking all of the, of taking its political and bureaucratic constraints seriously and then going further and saying, but we have to try and get more into this system than just the, the derisory way in which it goes about so much of what it does. Now, I've had the last word again, but you go. I'm taking the last word back. That's good, right. good. So on a very practical level, while I'm overseas, you know, we've got people in the Department of Communities and Justice trying to solve this with our staff. But there yep. might be others out there that listen to this and say, I actually know of an example of a child in out-of-home care being allowed to go on exchange. But yeah, that'd be good. And this is actually something to worth reflecting on. How is this a unique problem? As in, for my organization to try and send a child on exchange, you would have thought with, you know, 15 plus thousand children in New South yep. Wales of home care system, we should have tackled this one before. And it's telling that we haven't, that those children in the system haven't been allowed those normative experiences that many children have when growing up. 
Thank you, Jared. I won't try and have another last word. Thank you very much. And we might speak when you're over there. And if not, let's speak when you get back. Great. Thanks, Nicholas.